happy Mother's Day. This is the one sermon a year that I feel entirely ill-equipped to preach. And you know why? I've never been a mother. And uh, I've watched my mother and I've watched my wife mother and uh, I've tried it a few times and I'm frankly not very good at it. And this is what I've discovered. Every time Kathy went away, one of my kids got hurt and ended up in the hospital. And uh, it, it actually, no joke. And every time she went away, I'll tell you what happened. I'll give you a few of them. One time, my one daughter knocked both her front teeth out. Another time, uh, the, actually, it was the next day, uh, she crashed and cut her head open, had to get six stitches. And then uh, my other daughter got, fell off the teeter-totter, got the teeter-totter in the chin. When it came back and swung, she had four stitches in that chin. Uh, then my son got hit by a bike on the street, knocked him down, he broke his collarbone. Uh, that didn't all happen in, in one go. That was three different instances. But it was each one of those was while Kathy was away. And uh, when my son broke his collarbone, uh, being a typical father, I told him to walk it off. And, uh, and he was still whining, so I took him to the play structure and told him to swing on the monkey bars a bit, and that would probably hurt, straighten things out. By the evening, he was still whining in pain, so I took him to emergency room. Turned out his clavicle was broken clean in half like this. So then Kathy comes home and she says, Mark, I can't leave you at home with the kids for even one day and they end up in the hospital. I said, yeah, eh? weird how these coincidences happen. She says, it's not a coincidence. And uh, you know, I gotta say this, that maybe I wasn't good at, at, at keeping them safe, but I always made sure they had a balanced diet when Kathy was away. So this is how it worked. Monday was McDonald's, Tuesday was Taco Bell, Wednesday was Burger King, Thursday Pizza Hut. It's very important to balance the diet. You don't wanna just take them to McDonald's every day. That would be wrong, fathers. <laughs> and so I'm not, you know, a terrible parent. Uh, you know, one day it was funny, Kathy was away, which she didn't do very often, as you know. And uh, she was away, and their grandmother, the kid's grandmother, called. And my youngest got the phone, and uh, Grandma asked this, who's at home? And she said, there's nobody home. It's just me and Jordan and Kristen and Dad, and we're all by ourselves. <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, this morning, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about this thing called motherhood. And we're going to talk about, in particular, about the seeds of motherhood. And uh, we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 31, which many of you know is the chapter on the virtuous woman. And we're not going to go through the whole thing. We don't possibly have time to go through it. It is an exhaustive look at women, not only exhaustive, but exhausting. Uh, you go read it this afternoon, and after you finish reading it, you'll probably have to lie down and have a nap. I mean, this woman, whoever she was, was this amazing woman who just did it all. But the last verse, or almost the last verse of Proverbs chapter 31 says this. It says, your children will rise up and call you blessed, and your husband also will praise you. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at more of the concept rather than trying to get through the whole Proverbs 31, because I won't possibly have time to do that. But we're going to be looking at this thing. I'm calling the seeds of motherhood. And of course, in typical Mark Hughes style, I've come up with an acrostic, and here's the seeds of motherhood, S-E-E-D, and the S stands for steer them carefully. The E stands for educate them morally. The other E stands for embrace them frequently, and the D stands for discipline them lovingly. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 31. I'm just going to read a little bit at the beginning to kind of set the stage. And then, of course, leave the rest to your imagination. But Proverbs 31, verse 1, says this. The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him, what my son and what son of my womb and what son of my vows. And so he starts off, King Lemuel starts off by saying, these are the things my mother taught me the words or the utterances from my mom. Now, here's what's sort of fascinating or disturbing, depending how you look at it. We have no idea who King Lemuel is. There is no King Lemuel in history. In fact, he's not mentioned anywhere else in scripture. Most commentators believe that it actually was King Solomon. And who knows, maybe this was some sort of nickname his mother Bathsheba had for him, like, you know, Munchkin. You know, this is the words of King Munchkin or whatever. Who knows? We don't really know. But anyway, that's not really what's, what's important here. What's important is the king, whoever he is, credits his mother for who he is. And he spends an entire chapter after talking about this thing called womanhood and motherhood and giving us all of this information about it. 
And what we can see is that, that whoever he was, his mother had a profound influence in causing him to be the man that he became. And so my first point is this, is that the S stands for steer them carefully. There was a poem that came out in 1867, and it was called The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. And no, it wasn't a horror story about a deranged nanny. What it was was a tribute to mothers. And it went like this, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And it was talking about the influence of mothers, which history, by the way, has, has proven out time and time again. When Winston Churchill became prime minister, he was being introduced, and they went through his educators, his teachers and his tutors, and they actually named him. And he stood up and he said, you have omitted the most important one of all, them all my mother. Napoleon, the emperor of France, he said this, the future destiny of a person is always in the work of the mother, which is fascinating for a Frenchman to say that because this is what we know about French history. There were 69 kings in French history, 66 of them were tyrants. And someone actually researched this and discovered this amazing fact that out of the 66 tyrannical kings of France, every single one of them was raised not by their mother, but by tutors and by people in the, in the king's court and in the palace. And only three of them were raised by their mother. It was Henry VI and Louis XII and Louis IX. Those three were raised by their mother and they were historically the only decent kings that France ever had. In fact, Louis IX was the only one canonized. He became a saint. You're supposed to be sort of pretty good when you're to become a saint, right? And one of the kings of, of, of France actually is today a, a Catholic saint. I mean, there's a Saint Mark too, but I'm not him. <laughs> you kind of knew that, didn't you? You look into scripture and you discover that the women, the mothers, had a profound influence in many, many people in scripture. For example, Jacob was Israel and he was the father of the, all the Jewish race that we know today. Who was the greatest influence in his life? Think about it. His mother, his father. It was actually his mother, Rebecca, because Isaac, his father, favored his twin brother, Esau. We look at, at uh, Moses, for example. Uh, who was the greatest influence in his life, his father or his mother? We don't know anything about the father, but we know the mother spared his life, and he was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter, and of course he went on to earn his PhD. Potential Hebrew deliverer. Sure, you knew that. Uh, we look at John the Baptist. Who was the hero in the story of John the Baptist, Zachariah or Elizabeth? Clearly Elizabeth, Zachariah didn't even believe she was pregnant. And then we have, of course, Jesus, and who was the hero in this story? Was it Joseph or Mary? Well, we hear a lot more about Mary. She was there from the beginning to the very end. In fact, think about it, Joseph is conspicuously absent through the narrative of the gospel. So much so that many commentators think he probably passed away, which is probably a good assumption. But his mother was there right to the very last moment, right to the moment that he hung on the cross. Could you imagine being Jesus' mother, ladies? Would you clean up your room? What do you think? You were born in a stable, right? <laughs> How about Cain's mother? Cain's mother, Eve, she would have said, Cain, would you quit beating on your brother Abel? One of these days, you're going to kill him. How about Noah's mother? Noah, would you quit bringing home stray animals? How about David's mother? Would you quit playing with a slingshot in the house? Go out and practice your harp. We paid good money for those lessons. You know, mothers are mothers, aren't they? There is this book called Cradles of Eminence. It came out originally in, in 1962. Here's the updated version. And what it did was it actually tracked the childhood of 400 eminent people, 400 incredible achievers, people you would all know, Einstein and uh, Eisenhower, and the list went on and on and on. Uh, then what happened was uh, a few years ago, their children, which is also kind of interesting, that their children updated uh, the book and came up with this new version, the second edition, and it actually tracks 700 famous people and includes people like, as you can see, Martin Luther King Jr. and John Wayne. Of course, he'd be up there. Why wouldn't he? The Duke. And so what they did was they looked at these 400 and then subsequently 700 high achievers, highly eminent people throughout history, and they wanted to know this. What were their childhoods like? What were the commonalities? What were the things that allowed people to reach their full potential in life? Here's some good news for you. There is no one single model of parenting that you have to know. There is no one model. There are, people are all over the maps, and people can achieve no matter what kind of family and what kind of situation you live in. But there were a few commonalities, and one of them was the profound influence of the parents in these children, the fact that they were guiding them and steering them and encouraging them, and in particular, the work 
of the mother. And when you look through history, it's interesting how many times you see a mother that was in the background helping, encouraging, and carefully, not pushy, but steering and guiding their children. There's one story that's, that's in the book, uh, and it's the story of, of Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower was the supreme allied commander in the Second World War. He actually is the most decorated soldier in human history. And when the war was over, and in 1953, he became president of the United States. He was actually the most beloved president I think the United States ever had because he was this war hero, and he was kind, and he was compassionate. And uh, he just sort of had the whole package. And he was the only president in history that was ever baptized as a Christian while he held office. And during his baptism, he uh, invited the media and all kinds of people. And there was about 100 media to his baptism. He unashamedly declared his faith in Christ. And they asked him this question. They said, Mr. President, you have known all the great people of our time. Who was the greatest man that you ever met? He said, the greatest man I have ever met was not a man at all, but a woman my mother. And he tells this story about when he was growing up. He said, one day we were playing cards and my mother dealt me a very bad hand. And I complained bitterly about the hand that she had dealt me. And she looked at me and she pointed at me and she said, Dwight, you will go out into the world where there will be people that will not love you like I love you. And so you need to realize that this is the hand that you've been dealt and you need to trust God and play that hand and be the man of God that he has called you to be. He said that was the greatest lesson that I had ever learned from my mother. And as we look at our own lives, we realize that oftentimes our parents have this ability to influence our lives, and our mothers in particular. And, and a lot of parents, they say, well, it's not really our job to steer our kids. We should let them do whatever they want. You know what the problem with that is? Sometimes they don't know what they want, and certainly not what they should be. You know, I can't decide whether I want to be a fireman, a, a doctor, or a circus clown. And you know, they're just not clear on it. And who knows their strengths and their weaknesses better than their parents? Here's a story about my family when uh, my, my grandmother, she had two kids, uh, two sons, my uncle and my father, and she determined from the moment they were born that one was going to be a doctor and one was going to be a lawyer. That was very important in those days, those kind of high esteem jobs. Guess what my uncle and my father were in that order? A doctor and a lawyer. And here's the ironic part of it. My dad didn't want to be a lawyer. He actually went to law school because his mother was kind of nudging him along, so he went to law school. He thought that's fine. And then his intention was to go to Harvard Business School and to go into the world of business. But what happened after he finished law school is his father got sick, and he had to take over the law practice. And he practiced law for 50 years and never did go to Harvard. And he always kind of regretted the fact that he never went to Harvard. And he always thought that maybe he had missed his calling. But I looked at him and I realized he absolutely loved his job. He, as I said, he practiced law for 50 years, almost literally till the day he died in his 70s. He once argued a case all the way to the Supreme Court, an honor very few lawyers get. And he was appointed and named the Queen Counsel by the Attorney General. He had an esteemed and a brilliant law career. You know what my conclusion was? Mama knows best. <laughs> That's what I think. I think of my own upbringing, and I think of how my mother kind of pushed me along. And she wanted, we grew up Catholic, she wanted me to be an altar boy. Now, I was always terrified about that, because I thought, if I end up an altar boy, I know I'm just one step away from the ministry. And the last thing I want to do is end up in the ministry. <laughs> you can well imagine that, right? And then, so not only is she pushing me in one direction, and then what I felt like she was doing is when I came up with ideas of my own, it seemed like she was deliberately sabotaging them. Give you an example. I'm 10 or 11 years old. Everybody in my class, all the guys are all try, trying out for the hockey team. So I came home, told my mom I was going to try out for the hockey team, but I didn't have any skates, any hockey skates. So I said, I got to try out for the hockey team. I need some hockey skates. She says, I'm not buying you hockey skates because you might not make the team. You might not like hockey. And so you know what she did? She sent me to the hockey tryouts wearing her white women's figure skates. <laughs> not only did I not make the team, but I've been struggling with my sexual identity ever since. <laughs> you imagine? 
And so, so I'll tell you what, I told this story one time in a Sunday sermon. It was the very day we were having a newcomer's lunch. And I'm in this other room here, and we're having lunch with this couple, this family. They've been in the church, I don't know, maybe two or three months, and we were just getting to know them. And she turns to me, and she says, oh, I just love it when you tell stories about your mother. And I said, why is that? She says, then I nudge my kids and say, see, I'm not so bad. <laughs> Mark, Mark, I'm sick and tired of listening Mom. to all these crazy stories. I'm not going to get down here. I'm coming up. I'm in the middle of a sermon I here. I don't care. I, said, I'm, I'm I think this might be rebuttal time. <laughs> rebuttal time. I'm telling you from the, straight from the horse's mouth, the truth is, Mark was not raised by wolves. <laughs> he was raised by this wonderful father you hear about and this glorious, glamorous mother <laughs> you see before you. <laughs> and another thing, we brought him up according to Dr. Spock, the child psychologist of our time. He was wonderful, not that pointy-eared guy. No, and not only that, I'm not 86. I've never been 86. I am 39. <laughs> I've been 39 for decades. I should have known that. She has been saying that. <laughs> Mark is my number three son in a list of five sons. And he has two sisters, twins. I Are have you... sisters? I knew you didn't know. <laughs> he calls them thing one and thing two. Are you here, Andrea? <laughs> Yay! There's one of the twin sisters! They went to school across the street. And so Mark would go to bed, kept his clothes on, and as soon as the last bell rang, he jumped out of bed, ran across the school grounds, got in his seat, and <laughs> slept for the rest of the day. I was never late. We had a lovely cleaning lady, but he called her that old rat bag. <laughs> when his dad heard that, he took away his allowance for the rest of his life. I, I didn't even get an allowance. Quiet. <laughs> this is my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> when there were parties in the neighborhood, Mark went. Of course, he was a teenager by this time. And he'd come home at a, at a decent time. Went to his room, but... He'd get out the window, jump to the ground, and go to the party, and come home at 5 o'clock in the morning. We never knew. <laughs> never. And when he was in that school, he went to the top of the school. He was fooling around on the top with his buddies. And the principal came along. No, not the principal. The janitor. And he said, you guys get down off of that roof, or I'm going to send you to the principal. Then you'll find out. And Mark said, oh, oh, and he jumped off the roof onto the ground. It was only two stories. <laughs> he broke his foot and he, he hobbled home. <laughs> he got all the way home, he was so... But he didn't get any sympathy in our house. We don't give sympathy. <laughs> he had to suck it up, <laughs> which is very good training for the ministry. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> When he was a boy, he never did anything I asked him to. I'd say, Mark, will you take out the garbage? Will you clean the walk? And he'd say, sure, Mom, I'll do that. I'd love to do that for you. But he never did it. <laughs> never! Never! Busted. Well, when he was older, he said to me, Mom, I actually believe that the Lord is calling me into ministry. What? <laughs> Lord, are you sure you've got the right guy? <laughs> you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, sure, Lord, I'll do that. I'd love to do that for you, Lord. <laughs> you know what? Behind every successful son, there's a very surprised mother. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Thank you. My mother, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. It's almost like she was born for the stage, huh? 
And the mother always gets the last word. Did I point that out? All right, so number one, the S stands for steer them carefully, and the E stands for educate them morally. And I want to have a look at, at Proverbs 31 again. We're going to look at what Kim Lemuel, King Lemuel says next. And it's in verse 3, and he says, Do not, these are the words of his mother, by the way, do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. And so the advice that his mother gives him is this. You need to stay away from strange women. You need to stay away from sexual immorality and intoxicating drink because those are the things that destroy kings. Well, we know history has bore that out. Not only do we know that it has bore that out in kings, but in each and every one of us. And here's what we need to remember, that it's true of both fathers and mothers. But if we don't educate our kids morally, if we don't instill the kind of values and morals that we want them to live out their entire day, where do you think they're going to get them? Let me say something and ask you if you could have heard this expression. In fact, you can probably finish it for me. It goes like this. It takes a village to... It takes a village to raise a child. This is one of these popular expressions today. You hear people saying it all the time. And it sounds so noble and so wonderful and so comforting and so very misguided. And let me tell you why. It does not take a village to raise a child. It takes a mother to raise a child. Here's my point. Do you live in a village that you want raising your children? Maybe that was true in some other days where people in the village had common values. But today, the village in which we live in does not share your values. And if you let the school educate them, if you let your kids' friends educate them morally, if you let the internet educate them morally, you are in big trouble. And it takes a mother for this job to instill the values and the morals that are going to keep their, their kids on track for the rest of their lives. I mean, if there was ever a time where young people are living where there's this huge moral vacuum, today is that day. I mean, think of the pressure that is on your kids. It is almost like a huge vortex or vacuum that is sucking them into the ways of the world. The, the sexuality and the alcohol and the drugs and all of the other things that go with that, they're being pulled by this great vacuum of our world. And if we don't stand against that, and particularly as mothers, if you don't instill those values, they will not stand because the village will corrupt your children. I'm going to tell you something, kind of a frightening statistic. But I'm going to share it with you anyway because it's true. 70% of young people in the church today in North America leave the church by 20 years old. We've been watching this trend even in our own church. Regrettably, we've been looking at this and we're saying, how do we keep these kids? How do we prevent them? And what happens is the world is calling them. The world is seducing them. And there they are. They grew up in the church and they went to Sunday school and the world is beckoning and calling and they look over there and they say, I think I've missed something. I think I've missed the fun and I think I've missed these things. And they get pulled and they get drawn by the things of the world. 70% by the age of 20 have dropped out of the church. But there's some good news in this story that you never hear people talking about, and I'm going to share it with you, because the latest research has shown this, that two-thirds of that 70%, two-thirds of them ends up coming back to church at some point in their life and getting involved once again. You know why? Because of you, Mom, and because of you, Dad, because the Scripture says, Proverbs 22, what? It says, train up a child in the way he should go, say it with me, and when he is old, he will not depart. You see, when you inculcate those truths and those values and those morals into your children, guess what? They carry them with them. And maybe, and maybe sometimes they will get pulled off into the world. And maybe they go into that world. But you know what? We have this wonderful thing working on our behalf called guilt and conviction of the Holy Spirit. And God's always at work. And, and they're always feeling uneasy. And two-thirds of those kids are going to come back. That's the good news. And then I started thinking about the other side of this equation. I thought, what about the 30%? What about the 30% that does not leave? What keeps them in the church? What keeps them involved in the things of God? And so I poked around, and finally I found the research on that, and it was actually quite extensive. And uh, researcher Ed Stetzer did the work on this, and he interviewed hundreds of kids that had stayed in the church into adulthood and never left. And there were three commonalities, three, three things that came up again and again, and I want to share them with you. The first one was this. Generally, not always, but generally, they were children of parents who stayed married and stayed in the church. 
Some of you can't do anything about that, but that was the first thing. The second thing was this. They were in churches where the pastor preached messages relevant to young people. Nailing it. I don't know what you think. <laughs> Thank you for the 12 of you that agreed with that. And the, and the third thing was this and it's also very important, is that they usually had another male other than their parent, or not male, but another adult other than their parent that had actually in some way taken them under their wing. Another influence of another adult, either a, a kids worker or a youth worker or a youth pastor, and that there was something augmenting and supporting the work of the parents. And see, that's why we hire these staff, and that's why we have youth pastors, and that's why we have children's workers, and, and try to do and invest in that part of it because this is the absolute key. And you know what? It's, it's a tough job, isn't it? Parenting is the toughest job you will ever have. I had a pastor tell me that this week. He said to me, you know, he says, of all the things I've done, and he planted an inner city church, he said, the far hardest thing I've ever done in my life was, was parent my children. I thought, well, I bet your wife's not complaining about that because they're better gifted at it than, than you are. But it never ends. Parents, I want to tell you this. We have, we have mothers in this room that are who knows how old, and you are still doing it. You realize it never really ends, and you become the grandmother, and you carry on. Let me tell you about a letter I got. It, it's kind of funny. I, I shouldn't laugh at it, but there is some funny parts to it. And I get this, this letter from a viewer, and she writes me. It's, she's from Southern Manitoba, and she says, Dear Pastor Mark, I watch your show all the time. I really enjoy it. I really need you, some advice from you. I'm really having trouble with my sons. My two sons are, are, are drinking, and they're running around, and they, they won't come to church, and I don't know what to do. Can you please give me some advice? And then she says this. P.S. I'm 93 years old, and my sons are 67 and 69. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, what advice do I give her? You know, do I write her back and say, oh, those little rascals? <laughs> you should ground them. <laughs> You know, I don't know what to do about that. But the point is that you never end being a mother. So the first thing is this. You, you steer them carefully. The second thing is you educate them morally. And the third thing is that you embrace them frequently. Now, I want to show you a verse from the book of Isaiah. And it's Isaiah 66. And this is what it says. Listen carefully. It says, as a mother comforts her child, so will I. This is God speaking. So will I comfort you that you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And all throughout the scripture, there are many references to the female characteristics of God. You know, we don't often think about this because we always think of God as, as a man. We always think of God as the father because he's presented us uh, his, himself to us that way. And we pray to the heavenly father. And, and that's true and that's appropriate. However, if you look into scripture, you discover that God does not only have male characteristics, but also female characteristics, not only the characteristics of the father, but also of the mother. This is one of many verses on that. All you have to do is go back to Genesis 1, where it says that God created man in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. And so the female characteristics that every mother and every woman has, those characteristics come from the very nature and character of God himself. And I just don't want you to miss that, that we, we always relate to God as the father because he obviously has the nature of the mother because we and women in particular were created in the image of God. And there is something about it, even in this verse, where it talks about how as a mother will comfort her child. You know, in Hosea, there's another verse comparing God to a mother, and it says, as a mother raises her child up to her cheek, and that concept of the embrace, and the human embrace that fathers should and can give, but mothers are uniquely gifted, almost innately gifted to be able to embrace a child. I'll give you an example of that was in when the Iron Curtain came down, and one of the countries that was under Russian control was Romania, and the West went in, and, and to their horror, they discovered there was these huge orphanages, sometimes with hundreds, and sometimes with thousands of little babies in cribs, babies that had been abandoned because the mothers couldn't afford to feed them. And so they were in these government-run orphanages, and they were getting food, and they were getting shelter, and yet many of the babies were dying. And they discovered that the reason the children were dying was for lack of human affection. 
that people literally cannot live without human touch. And people cannot live without human embrace. And God put women into the world so that they might, as one of their jobs as mothers, they would embrace. It's interesting, those of you that have been in the birthing room, that baby comes into the world. There's a lot of blood and sweat and tears and screaming and wailing, and apparently it's uncomfortable for the woman as well. And um, <laughs> this is all going on in the birthing room. The mother goes through this traumatic experience that you're probably going to need counseling after, yet the first thing she does is take and embrace that child, almost instinctively, instead of, get that thing away from me. Do you have any idea how much grief? No. Instinctively, she knows to reach out and to embrace that baby. There is something in it that God has placed in the heart and the nature of us as humans, and as I said, mothers in particular. And we cannot live without that embrace. I was talking to a mother of a teenage girl uh, a couple of weeks ago, and so she was, I said, how was your day? And she said, oh, my teenage daughter, 14 years old, she had a complete meltdown at school. And she came home absolutely distraught. And I said, well, what did you do? And she said, well, I just hugged her, and she had a good cry. And I said, yeah, okay, but what did you do? And she said, I just told you. I hugged her, and she had a good cry. I said, well, then what happened? And then she said, then it was done. We were through it. I said, let me get this right. What did you do? Like, what did you do? She said, I hugged her and she had a good cry. And as my, my, my male brain's going the whole time, you mean, yeah, but what did you do to fix it? Like, did you go down to the school and say, are there some bullies down there? I'm going to give them peace of my mind. Did you go and see and try to get that teacher fired? You know, in her class, that's what parents do the night today. They're so stupid. And, oh, it's not little Johnny's fault. It's the teacher's fault. All she did was embrace her daughter, let her have a good cry. She was 14 years old. And on she went. You see, we need the power of the embrace. I don't actually care how old you are. I, I, you know what? Here's the thing. If you're here today and you need a hug today, you've met my mom. Go see my mom. She'll take care of you. <laughs> Lord knows I'm not going to help you with it. But my mother, can, my mother can set you up today. I promise you. There is something about a mother's embrace. There's something about a mother's hug that is beyond description, isn't it? And let's face it, there's some people that only a mother could love, right? Isn't that true as well? My mother will love you, but, you know, there you go. There's this story of this, this, this mom, and she's getting on the bus with her baby, and she, she gives the bus driver her ticket, and the bus driver looks up and says, that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. And she's walking back to her seat, and she's getting hotter and hotter and more and more miffed, and she sits beside this guy, turns to the guy and says, the bus driver just insulted me. Well, this guy says, well, you shouldn't take that. You should run up there and give him a piece of your mind. And she says, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go take him on. He says, yes, you do that right now. Here, I'll hold your pet monkey while you go. <laughs> yeah, that was mean. I know. All right, so the, the S stands for steer them carefully. The E stands for educate them morally. The second E stands for embrace them frequently. And the last and the final thing, the D stands for discipline them lovingly. How many of you have noticed that discipline of our children has kind of fallen out of favor these days? I have a question for you. It's going to be a little indicting for some of you, but here it goes. Everybody enjoys their own children. The big question for you is this. Does anybody else enjoy your children? And when you see these, these kids that are unruly and running around and undisciplined, nobody else enjoys those kids. And you might think it's great, but you see, what we've done is we've come full circle in this thing where now people don't discipline anymore. And they just sort of let it ride out because they think, well, you can't do anything to discipline your kids. You have no control. And at the very best, what you can do is, is give them a time out. Oh, little Johnny, he's one and a half. I'm giving him a timeout. You go sit in the corner. This is a timeout. He's one and a half. He doesn't actually speak English. He, all he hears is blah, 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 blah. That's what he thinks is coming out of your mouth. And what he thinks is scream louder, scream louder, scream louder. That's what he's hearing. Now here, let me tell you why this is so important, is, is that our kids need to be disciplined. The Bible talks about discipline. It says that every child or every son that the Lord receives, he disciplines. And when you became a Christian, does that mean he beat the tar out of you? No, that's not what I'm talking about. That is not the kind of discipline I'm talking about. You see, here's what the scripture says in the Proverbs, Proverbs 14. It says, 
He who hates his son, did you hear that? He who hates his son does not correct him. But he who loves his son disciplines him promptly. How many of you, when you were growing up, the worst kid in the neighborhood was the one who had no rules? How many of you? How many of you remember that kid? How many of you were that kid? You for sure were that kid. I can tell by looking at you. And there, was, and there was always these kids. There was always one or two kids in the neighborhood. And they had no rules. And they had no curfew. And they could stay out all night. And you know what? They were the ones who always got in trouble. And what happened is we have, we have lost the art of discipline. And as again, I just want to reinforce it again. It does not mean whacking your kids all the time. In fact, it means quite, something quite differently. What it means is simply this. Let me, and I don't have time to expand on the whole thing. But let me give you the short form of it. You reward good behavior and you punish bad behavior. Oh, Pastor Mark, that's like crazy. No, that's, that's how you say, why would you even say that, Pastor Mark? Why would you say, you know, punish bad behavior? Because I watch parents today and I see them rewarding bad behavior. You see this kid acting out, screaming his head off. What do you do? You give him an ice cream cone to get him to shut up. That's called rewarding bad behavior. And here's why this concept is so important. Because when your kids go out into the world, this is how life works. Life rewards good behavior and punishes bad behavior. Isn't that true? If you rob something, what do they do? Steal something, they put you in jail. If you kill people, they put you in jail. There's a lot of consequences for bad behavior. On the other hand, if you do things right, you get rewarded. If you have a job and you work hard and you're on time or early, guess what? You get promoted, you get raises. If you're late every day and taking sick, sick days every third day, what do they do? They punish you, they fire you. So the sooner our kids figure this out, the better. There was this story, I don't know how many of you caught it in the news a few years ago in Florida, and it was these parents that just became completely undone with their teenagers, a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old, and they could not control them, they couldn't deal with them, the kids wouldn't do any chores, wouldn't clean up their room, they were living in absolute anarchy and chaos, and so this is what the parents did, the parents went on strike. And here's the picture of it. The parents moved into the driveway and lived in the driveway in a tent and announced to the whole neighborhood that they were on strike because the kids didn't give them respect and wouldn't cooperate. Now here's my question for you. Who's the problem here, the kids or the parents? <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll let you figure that out. I think the parents are the idiots in this one. <laughs> That's what I think. Who would do such a thing? But parents do because they haven't learned the art of discipline. You say, how would I learn that? You would go read a book on it. How about James Dobson's Dare to Discipline for Starters? So that's the D. So we have, we have, we have steer them carefully. We have educate them morally. We have embrace them frequently and discipline them lovingly. I want to end with this thought. You see, there is something about mothers that is so unique that I think it's innate. I think that God placed it in the heart of mothers and it is so particular to who they are the moment they become a mother. There's a story, and it was sort of a Legends of the Sea, and the Legends of the Sea went like this, that in the old days of sailing ships, there would be sailors that would get washed overboard, and those sailing ships, a lot of times, could not turn around, could not rescue these sailors, and the sailors would oftentimes get lost at sea. And there was these stories of Legends of the Sea about sailors who were washed overboard that a dolphin came along and buoyed them to the surface and kept them alive while they were floundering in the water, and they ended up living to tell about it. Now, of course, people just thought that was legend. People just thought that was stories and old, old sailor stories. But marine biologists came along and they discovered this, that the female dolphin, and only the female dolphin, when they give birth, the babies are, of course, mammals and breathe air, not water. And so the female dolphin has to buoy its child to the surface until it's strong enough to swim and breathe on its own. And so they discovered that these legends of the sea were actually true and that the female mother dolphins instinctively went and saved the lives of sailors who were floundering and drowning in the sea. You see, there's something about what God has put in the heart of women. Why? Because children are a heritage of the Lord. They are his reward. He's going to take care of it. You, as mothers, you don't know how to do everything. We don't know how to parent as, as we ought. But God somehow helps us along the way. Let me close with one final story here. And this story is, happened in a, in a sister church of ours in Alberta. And there was a woman named Melanie and her husband, Kevin. They had two kids. 
And what happened was she was diagnosed with a brain tumor and they gave her chemotherapy and the, and the tumor shrank and they said, we can't guarantee you're okay, but for now it's gone. And so they decided they were gonna have a third child and uh, they were gonna do this thing and, and while she was still healthy. So she got pregnant and uh, several weeks into her pregnancy, the doctor said the cancer has come back and it's come back with a vengeance and we're gonna have to do chemo to save your life but here's what'll happen, it will actually kill your baby, and so we need to take your baby, we need to abort your baby in order to save your life. And she said, I am not taking the life of my baby. And they, they tried to explain to her, they said, look, your, your kids need a mother, your, your husband needs a, a wife, and, and you, can't, you have to sacrifice this child for the sake of your own health. And she said, I would never do that. I would never take the life of my own child to spare my own life. I will not do it. So she refused the abortion and she refused chemotherapy. And of course, the brain tumor grew and grew and grew. And it got to the point after several months, it got to the point where they were no longer trying to spare her life. They were merely trying to keep her long enough alive to give birth to this child. Then in December of that year, it was about seven months into the pregnancy, they thought she's almost gone. They went and they took the baby by C-section, a little gyra came into this world, a perfectly healthy little baby boy. But their mother was in terrible shape in the hospital and was actually dying. Six weeks after the birth of their child, uh, Kevin was sleeping in the next room, her husband, and he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw his wife, Melanie, coming to him, walking across a field, and she was dressed in white, and the, the white was glowing. And then he heard the sound of trumpets, and the trumpets awakened him like this, and he knew something was happening, and he ran to his wife's bedside as in her last moments of life on earth, she took her last breath in, her, in his arms, rather, and she gave up her life. And we look at that picture, an incredible story of sacrifice, and yet God in that moment gave this, this husband, Kevin, a sense that she had done the right thing and that she was in glory and the trumpets blew and he, God gave him that dream to signify this so there'd be some sort of sense of peace in this. But don't miss the incredible sacrifice that this mother made because only a mother can understand the kind of preservation that is necessary to keep another human being alive. What are the seeds of motherhood? They are to steer them carefully, to educate them morally, to embrace them frequently, and to discipline them lovingly. To love their children and knowing this, that your children will rise up and call you blessed. And your husbands also will praise you. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. God bless you.